the idea of starting with a pilot where you're not building something humongous, you're not married to this program for the rest of your life. You're just running an experiment that frees people up to get more creative, get more innovative, take some risks and put this thing out there without it meaning this is my lifetime commitment. So it better be perfect. I mean, we know that's how you never get something done. (laughs) Welcome to Marketing and Mindset for Wellness Coaches, the podcast for health coaches and wellness entrepreneurs just like you who are building a business, making the world a healthier place and designing a first class life. I'm your host, Kim Foster, MD and certified business coach, and I'm on a mission to help you up-level your strategy and raise your mindset so you can truly thrive and grow your business. Let's get started. If you would love to create a group coaching program, then this episode is definitely for you. A lot of the coaches in my community have this as a goal, or they have perhaps started doing it, you know, offering a group coaching program, but there are a lot of moving parts that can potentially go into a group program and a lot of decisions to be made. So it's not always the easiest strategy to get set up, but it can be so very worthwhile because it's an excellent way to scale your business and help more people and touch more lives and really offer something truly transformative to your community. And one of the aspects of a group program that I don't hear enough people talking about is how long should your program be? Should it be one month or three months or six? Is there a perfect length of time? Well, as it turns out, there probably is a perfect length of time for your program. And this might be different than it is for other people's group programs, but there's a good chance that there is a sweet spot in terms of length for your group program and Finding this sweet spot is something that can make a big difference for you, not just in how much you enjoy running your program, but also in the results that your participants will get and how much participation there is and how well you're able to enroll and fill your program. In today's episode, my guest and I talk about exactly this issue and how to go about finding that sweet spot length for your program. My guest is Annie Schusler, and Annie is a business coach and the host of the Rebel Therapist podcast. Annie helps therapists and healers and coaches to make an impact beyond their traditional private practice. And in this conversation, we talk about how she improved participation and launch rates in her own group program, not by tweaking the content or changing the offer, but by experimenting with the length of the program. If you have tried running a group and you've struggled to see your participants get the full value out of the program, then you are going to get a lot out of this conversation because, of course, there's a ripple effect that the quality of your program has. This will definitely influence your ability to collect meaningful testimonials and ultimately to sell your program and make the world a healthier place. I think you're going to love listening into this conversation. So without further ado, let's jump in. All right, dear listener, today I have got a terrific guest with me. Her name is Annie Schusler, and Annie is a business coach and the host of the Rebel Therapist podcast, and she helps therapists and healers and coaches to make an impact beyond their traditional private practice. So I know that she's got lots of amazing stories and wisdom to share. So welcome to the podcast, Annie. It is so great to have you here. Thank you so much, Kim. I am so excited to talk to you. Yeah, me too. I'm really looking forward to our conversation, especially I'm really interested in picking your brain about group programs. This is definitely a topic that is going to be of great interest to many of my listeners, and I'm sure that they cannot wait to hear your advice. However, before we get there, I'd just love to hear a little bit more about your story. Like, What was the journey that brought you to this place where you are right now? Well, speaking of group work, part of what brought me to where I am right now is that I love working with small groups. <laughs> like I, mm-hmm. I absolutely find that that's my sweet spot. And my history is that I was a therapist in private practice for 20 years. 
there was a lot of overlap. There were 10 years of overlap where I was doing both coaching and therapy, but I started out as a therapist in private practice, working with folks one-on-one and working with couples. And this work was such an honor and it fulfilled me in so many ways. And I found that it wasn't quite the right match for me. It wasn't really using all the parts of me that I wanted to use. And I was heading towards burnout, even though I had created the private practice that I thought I wanted, (laughs) that Mm. it was full and I had a wait list and all that good stuff. And I had gotten myself like certified in the Gottman method and done so much training. And I was the primary breadwinner. And then I realized that I was dreading my work and I was not feeling excitement when I would get up in the morning and think about going and doing this amazing work with folks. And so this little voice was telling me, you know, this isn't really, life is short. This isn't quite the right job for you. And so I started building a coaching business, a business coaching business. And I just followed that. I followed that voice to create what was really exciting me. And that has led me to small group work, which is so, it brings out the best in me. It brings out the best for my clients. And I'm not saying it's the right fit for everybody, but it was, it is absolutely what, what works for me. So I'm, I'm so happy and relieved to tell you that I do get up now and I'm really excited (laughs) to work with people in the way that I get to work with them. Mm, That's so awesome. I love that. I love that you listened to that, you know, just that, that little voice inside that said, this is just, just not quite right. So, and then followed that down the rabbit hole. I love it. Okay. So tell us just a little bit more about, you know, what, what do you do now? Like what, who do you help and, and how do you help them? Yeah. So I help coaches and therapists and healers of all sorts to create their pilot programs. So meaning that program that is going to bring them beyond a traditional private practice and into doing whatever the kind of work is that's really the best fit for them. So for me, it was, it is small group work. And for some people, it is moving into offering retreats or workshops, or it's about providing trainings to workplaces. For some folks, it is one-on-one, like creating the kinds of one-on-one packages that really work for them, not following other people's rules, but creating what works for them and getting great results for their clients. So we create pilot programs together, and then they build from there to grow their audiences and reiterate those programs and make them better and better. Mm. I really love your use of the term pilot program. That that sort of takes the pressure off, right? Like it doesn't have to be the perfect thing, um, but it is. It feels like a stepping stone because it sounds like you work with a fair number of like clinicians and and professionals and who have like a clinical, like more traditionally in the box one to one practice. And to sort of break out of that, you need something that that bridges you over into the other side, right? Yes. Yeah. And I think you're so right that the idea of a pilot, which is what I strongly believe works best is starting with a pilot where you're not, you're not building something humongous. You're not married to this program for the rest of your life. You're just running an experiment. And I think you're right. That frees people up to get more creative, get more innovative and take some risks and really put this thing out there without it meaning like this is my lifetime commitment, so it better be perfect. Because right. that's, I mean, we know that's how you never get something done. <laughs> <laughs> that is the best way to never get something done. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Okay, so let's dig a little deeper then and really talk about group programs because I definitely, I know that one of the things that you help people with is really optimizing those group programs, like start with the pilot, but then optimizing. And I think you've got kind of a unique approach um, of the one element of things that you experiment with. But can you tell me a little bit more about that? Yeah. So I encourage people to start with something 
like let's say you're building a group program in particular, Mm -hmm. to start with something relatively short. So when you think about who you want to work with and what kind of transformation you want to take them through to see if you can narrow that down to a relatively small, realistic, doable transformation. So instead of like, if you're working with folks who have toddlers and they are, you know, at the end of the rope with their toddler and don't know how to deal with tantrums, you wouldn't be saying in my program, we're going to get you to the point where there are no tantrums. (laughs) <laughs> you wouldn't do that. <laughs> or where like you love tantrums. Yeah, <laughs> right. Happen. We would come up with what is like with all the skills you have, what's a realistic transformation someone could go through in let's say two months and then build a program around that. So maybe you're going to say it's an, it's a four week program or it's an eight week program. And we're just going to get you from this very troubling before where you're just at the end of your rope, we're going to get you to the point where you always know what to do when you see a tantrum coming. Mm. And so instead of saying, we're going to create an eight month program, which might end up being the thing someday, but instead of saying, I'm going to create an eight month program to give parents all the skills that they'll need as parents, I encourage people to start much smaller and get a really quick win for themselves and for their participants. So that's one of the things I found with my own programs is I needed to experiment with different timeframes. And I experimented with a time frame of six months. And I found, I'm curious what you've found with this, but I found for me that some folks would drop out during that six month period, some folks would really flourish, take full advantage, but some folks life would get in the way and they wouldn't make it all the way to six months. And then I experimented with two days because I knew I could give people all the information they needed in two packed days. But I bet you know what happened. Like they took in all the information. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They didn't implement it or many of them didn't implement it. There's always going to be like these 20% of folks who will succeed in any format I give it to them. Mm -hmm. Yes. But for, I really want to get like that 80% to 100% of people following through. And so for me, I kept experimenting and I've found that for my particular outcome, I'm going for five weeks has been this beautiful sweet spot. And I'm not saying that's the right amount for every program But I think for every program, it's about experimenting and trying different lengths of time. I love that. That's great. Because yeah, although it seems like you're just moving one, like you're just changing the one variable of the length of Mm -hmm. time, but it actually, it changes the experience for people. Like you said, you know, it doesn't, a a super short program um, doesn't give them the time for implementation, which may or may not, depending entirely on your program, of course, right? May or may not be really a required thing. But then the six month format that it it sounds like you can take loads of time for implementation, but yeah, like it's more of an endurance thing then. Mm -hmm, Exactly. And I love what you just said about for some programs, two days could be perfect. Yeah. Like, let's say maybe it's a couple's workshop. I just worked with someone who her couple's therapy practice is totally full and she was feeling terrible that she had to keep turning people away. So she and her business partner created a couple's workshop that it's not going to do everything that working with them in therapy could, but it's going to do a lot and help these couples with their communication get them over some important hurdles. And they don't necessarily need that five weeks or six months of implementation time to make some big changes. Like Mm -hmm. doing a two-day intensive can get them really far. Yeah. And some things would certainly lend themselves to that sort of immersive experience. Mm -hmm. Um, And it really is in service of the ultimate outcome of the program. Absolutely. Hmm. I think that's a good point. And that if we step into it with an open mind of, let me just observe, like I may have a bias that I believe these folks need six months and they need, you know, 
weekly meetings for six months, but let me step in with an open mind and observe what really happens when I offer them that and what happens when I make it shorter and, and let your observation guide you. Yeah, I like that. And because it's all too easy to get kind of caught up in what the standard way of functioning is in your your industry, your niche, you know, what everybody else out there is doing and mm-hmm. think that that's the way. That's the only way. That's the way that we should all be doing it. And it's the way that's been successful for this person. So that's what I'm going to do too. Easy to get caught up in that, but not really and sort of lose sight of what actually is going to work for your people and your method and all of those pieces. Another thing I've I've done that with around, like you just said, don't just follow what other people are doing in my program. So it's five weeks and I also, so it's a small group, 15 people, but I also offer one-on-one asynchronous coaching across the whole five weeks. And mm. so that means any participant can submit a question to me at any time and then I'll create a personal video for them in, in response. And, you know, that's pretty intense. Like that's pretty yeah, for you. <laughs> labor intensive, time yeah. intensive. And I love it because I, I see how well it's working and how much it helps people not get stuck during the five weeks. And that means I need to charge enough to make that work for me. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, getting outside the box has helped me so much in looking at well, how could I make that possible? Like that's working so well. I freaking love it. So instead of just saying, but that's not how people do it. <laughs> you're supposed <laughs> to run group programs where you're not showing up too much. Well, it, it works really well for me because I've designed it in a way that I can do that. Yeah. I love that idea that asynchronous coaching. So yes, of course. But I mean, if you're keeping your group size limited, so 15 Mm -hmm. people max, then, and I mean, obviously not everybody's going to submit a question at all times, but then presumably you could kind of batch that. I'm just trying to, I'm thinking how you would play that out in terms of managing your workload. You batch it, record a few videos and send them out. And then people get that like high touch, really white glove feeling. Um, but you're not necessarily burning yourself out, which is a bad thing. Exactly. Yeah. And so I tend to do it on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays, and I just block out a couple hours each of those days. And I just make sure that I'm stepping into it when I'm at really peak energy and I got my cup of tea and Mm -hmm. I'm just going to chat with my participants. And yeah, that's exactly right. Batching has worked really well. And then I'm always looking at my notes to see, okay, what did this person, what were they stuck on last time? Have we moved forward? Because I want to help them kind of keep moving. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. I love that. Okay. So you, for you, the five week mark was, was the sweet spot Mm -hmm. for your particular group program. And even though you experimented with the different extremes of, of length of time, you know, this whole experimentation approach, I really love it. What are some other, you know, small experiments that you've led with your programs and things? One thing is thinking about group size, which I know we talked about just a little bit that I've landed around 15 and looking at when you're running a group or when you're working one-on-one with folks, what do you notice? And is a one-on-one offer helping people move forward in the way that you want it to, or do they need a little bit of group accountability? And then if you are working with a group, looking at what's that optimal group size where people are showing up and the vast majority of people are showing up to every call and they're not feeling kind of lost in the shuffle, but there's also enough people that they're getting that feeling of energy from the group and feedback from the group and accountability. So that's, that's one of them to work with. And then another one is looking at length of session. Mm. And so I've personally landed on 60 minutes as being this optimal time, as long as I've given people the work that they need to have done ahead of time. And they've, you know, they've done their homework, then 60 minutes is a really good amount of time for them to be able to show up for with energy on a zoom call. Mm -hmm. And not have to, you know, go dark by the end, <laughs> not have to uh, glaze over. 
So, but for some people, it's much longer. It depends on what their process is. So really observing people and asking for feedback on, on session length. Mm. That, yeah, that, that both of those aspects, like group size and length of session, those are really, those are really important. And there's so many different ways that you could go. I mean, the group size is, is a fascinating one for me. I've certainly, I like the small ish group size too, but it's so interesting how, like, I don't know if you've found this any, but you know, some, some groups are super chatty Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. (laughs) and engaged. And then another group, same size is, is not so much. And, and it's just, it can feel a bit more challenging to keep engagement going, to keep conversation, you know, or whatever is going on. I've found that challenging to really land on the right group size. I, I totally know what you mean. And it's interesting how, like, I'm about to start a new cohort of my program tomorrow. And I'll just know in the first moment, like I've already started getting to know them because I, I have them fill out some information about themselves before we start. But I know that first moment when I see all their faces and we start the conversation, I'm going to be like, oh, that's the personality of this group. (laughs) And I actually name each of my programs, like each cohort gets the name of a tree. I hope I never run out of trees. (laughs) (laughs) That's great. I love it. And so, yeah, so this one, I'm not, I hope I'm saying the tree right. Acacia or Acacia. Anyway, that's the name of Mm. the tree. And so I'll be curious to see, is this an extroverted group? Is this a kind of spiritually minded group? You know, what, what is their vibe? My last group was really kind and supportive. I mean, they always are, but those are just the words that I would use to describe that particular group, Mm -hmm. the Elm group. (laughs) Yeah, I love that. And yeah, and then I feel like once I see their personality, then I do need to make little adjustments. Like if this is a quiet group, then I'm going to need to sort of give myself some space to be quiet and let them come forward a bit. Mm -hmm. And if it's a much chattier group, then I need to bring myself forward in a way of, you know, warning them that I'm going to cut them off at times with a lot of love and compassion, but that I will be interrupting to keep things moving so that everybody has a chance. And yeah, that my energy has to adjust for whatever the tree looks like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I love that. That I, I say acacia tree. I think that's how acacia. I, I that think it's the right. yeah. but I have no idea if that's actually correct. Mm-hmm. It's the trees in Africa, right? Like on the savannah, the ones that are like spread out. I believe so, but I better research I before it. tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. You need to know your stuff. <laughs> How often do you launch a group and like fill a group to get yourself? Because it does take like that onboarding process like that. That takes quite a bit of energy, I would think, especially because it's a smaller, intimate group. You really do need to get to know each of the participants and get yourself, you know, and assessing the energy and all those things that we just mentioned. So how often do you do that? Yeah. So I run this at this point six times a year. Mm, It's quite a few. Yeah. So it's really always rotating. Like there's only a week or two between trees. (laughs) (laughs) And so I've got my calendar and my energy kind of synced up where there's that period before when I'm reading their questionnaires and I'm setting aside some time to get to know all of them. And then we move into those coaching weeks. And then when the coaching weeks are over, those five weeks of coaching, then I'm getting ready you know, kind of resting a little bit for the new group to come in. But what's so important for me, and I couldn't have set this up in the very beginning, but what's so important to me now is I've got a lot of it automated so that the only thing I really need to pay attention to is the actual coaching so that I'm not Mm -hmm. putting a ton of energy into, you know, the admin side of things. Yeah, There's, There's a lot of yeah, space for paying attention to these people. Yeah, I would think you'd need, you'd want to have a lot of that stuff. Ultimately, you know, not in the beginning as you're experimenting and things, but once you've figured out your, the formula that works for you um, and your clients and your process, then um, having as many things automated as possible so that you can just be present for the work, like for the actual coaching and be there for the group. So That's, that's great. I mean, we didn't, we haven't really talked about marketing and, um, but so if you've got just a couple of weeks break, is that, are you 
launching? Like, do you run a wait list? I'm just kind of curious, like how you actually um, yeah. you know, get, have so this flow. The way I do it is that people can sign up for the next cohort at all times. Mm-hmm. So I'm starting a group tomorrow, but for the last week, the next cohort has been available mm-hmm. instead of this one. Like this one has already cut off a week right. before so that people have time to do the pre-work. And then I move into enrolling the fig tree. <laughs> <laughs> you might, I don't know, you might run out of, of tree names as you can t- if you keep going with this because <laughs> you're doing a lot of groups, which is awesome. I love it. <laughs> right. So, and my marketing is mostly, it's not so much launch style. I do send out some emails that last week that is the last week to enroll. Mm -hmm. letting people know, you know, this is your last chance to get in this round, but mostly it's my marketing is pretty steady throughout the year. I have a podcast and I send out weekly emails and, you know, I do collaborations and, and some free trainings and all of that is fairly steady. So Mm -hmm. I used to launch where I had a two times a year program and I'm saying this for anybody who does not like that approach. Yeah. It can be great for people, but for me, it felt uneven. And I was kind of a different person during launching because I was so stressed. And I, you know, when all of your income has to come in two times a year, mm-hmm. it takes a certain kind of, you know, mindset to work through that. And I really like the steadier flow. And again, like I always want to say this, like that doesn't mean I think that's the right way to do it, but it's an option. And sometimes we, we forget that because launches can be so public and they stand out. So sometimes we can think like you got to do it that way, but really that's just one way to do it. Exactly true. And I mean, it's what we were saying before is that just because that's the visible way that you can see other people doing it, it does not mean that you have to do it that way if that doesn't work for you for whatever reason. And you're right, like doing a big, you know, launch once or twice a year is, it's flashy and it gets a lot of attention, but it's exhausting mm-hmm. <laughs> for sure for most. So I love your your format of, you know, the frequent groups that start continuously through the year. So nobody really, you know, your, your community, if somebody is keen on joining a group, they don't have to wait all that long to jump on board with the next group, which must be very appealing for them. Yeah. You know, I noticed something that I think this is a good thing actually for folks to pay attention to. When I ran it twice a year, I did an analysis because I'm nerdy like this. I did an (laughs) analysis at one point and I looked at, okay, so everyone who just signed up, when did they get on my email list? Mm -hmm. And I found that about 80% of them had gotten on my email list within the last two to three months. Hmm. And so then I realized uh, I'm probably kind of losing about half the people by launching this infrequently, which could be okay. Like Mm -hmm. you don't have to have Mm -hmm. everybody join your program, but it was edifying to realize, okay, so if people are getting on my list and then really quickly signing up, then it could work well to offer this more frequently. Because sometimes I told myself like people need a year to just read my emails and just hang out before they'll be ready. But I was really wrong about that. Hmm. That's fascinating. And so good for you to have that data that you can actually, you know, not just speculate on what you think is going on, but actually see what actually is going on um, for your potential clients. And so if that sales journey is shorter than you thought, then yeah, you don't want to lose. They'll just fade away and lose interest. Do you have a discovery call to onboard into the group or what do you do? I don't. So I have, I try to make sure I'm answering all of the questions and I track what kinds of questions I'm getting so that I can be answering them in my emails and in my sales page. And then when someone has a question, I I, I use email. So I use Loom Video, which is the same thing I mm. use for my asynchronous coaching. Nice. So I'll just go ahead and say, I'm going to, even if someone asks for a call, I just let them know I don't do it that way, but I'm happy to answer anything and I'll send them a video giving them a, a good detailed answer. 
That's beautiful. I like that. That that certainly, I mean, that that's an energy preserver too for people who don't love doing discovery calls or, you know, find it a bit of a bottleneck and things. So yeah, that's a great alternative. Yeah. Especially since like when I used to do calls, I didn't love those calls. Like mm-hmm. that was, it's not when I'm at my best. I'm at my best when I'm actually coaching people and on the discovery calls it was hard not to fall into this energy of like stress mm-hmm. and, you know, they're stressed, I'm stressed. And, you know, I was able to work with that and shift it a bit, but this is a even better fit for me is just, you know, having a different way to communicate with folks. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, certainly one of the the threads that is coming through this whole conversation is the way that you've really you know, giving yourself permission to find a way that works for you, regardless of what, you know, what, what you've done before or what other people are doing, but really like that experimenting and kind of get in there and see what's working from a perspective of like, what feels good for you and what works for you in your life, but also with using data, what's working for your community. Yeah. And I think, okay, so here's the thing. If I were listening to this, that I would be thinking is like, that's nice, but like, does that is that profitable? Like, does that even work? Mm. And so, in case any <laughs> <Good> question, because <laughs> I sometimes I felt like, well, yeah, I want it to feel good, but I also really want to make money. I'm the breadwinner in my family, and you know, we got these two kids, and you know, they need yeah, stuff. They need stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and so, what I have found, and I wish I had known this earlier, is that for me, being in that zone where I'm doing the stuff that feels best to me. I'm making so much more money. So it's not been difficult to fill my programs. Like it's actually, my programs have gotten so much more popular as I've leaned into these ways of working. And I see that, like, it's not all about me. Like I see that happening Mm -hmm. with my clients over and over again. Like as they lean into what's working better for them, they're making a lot more money. Yeah, I do generally find that that is true. Um, I, I, you know, of course there's exceptions, but yeah, when you're kind of aligned in that way, then things do have a way of, of working in your favor and, you know, in everyone's favor, it's kind of a win-win. So like, yeah. Yeah. Very cool. Well, we are just about out of time, Annie, but this has been so great. It's been just such a pleasure having you here and you've been so generous with all of this. And I love getting, you know, you letting us sort of peel back and look at the inner workings of, of how you've come to your sweet spot and really, um, you know, created uh, a structure and a setup that works for you and how other people can do the same. But so, I mean, before we go, where can our listeners learn more about you and connect with you? Thank you. And first of all, I just had so much fun talking to you. The time just like went by so fast. (laughs) It sure did. I could talk to you all day and (laughs) ask you a million questions. But so people can find me at rebeltherapist.me and that's where all my programs are and, you know, where my trees are. Awesome. (laughs) Yes. And then I also have a podcast called Rebel Therapist. Perfect. Okay. That is so great. Thank you so much. This was just really, really fun. And uh, yeah, definitely uh, we could keep talking forever, but I will let you go and have an amazing day, Annie. Thank you, Kim. Okay. There you have it. I hope my conversation with Annie helped give you some ideas for how you might tweak your group coaching program. If you already have one running or how you might set up your first group program, if you haven't actually done this yet, I'd be really curious to hear your thoughts on this issue. If you have tried running a group program, How long did you make it? Did it work like that? Did it not really work? Let me know by finding me on Instagram. I'm at Dr. Kim Foster over there and tag me in a post or send me a DM. All right, that is all that I've got for you today. Again, I would love you forever if you would take a couple of minutes to give this podcast a rating and a review. I so appreciate your feedback. And of course, I really appreciate your help in growing this podcast. All right, have an amazing week and I will talk to you again very soon. 
Thank you so much for tuning in today. Now, if you enjoyed this episode and you're excited to take your coaching business to the next level, then I would love to invite you to attend my free online class called How to Build a Six-Figure Health Coaching Business Using One Signature Program. And that's even if you're a brand new coach. I will be revealing the three behind-the-scenes secrets to financial freedom without exhaustion, burnout, or being a slave to social media. In this free class, you'll learn the exact blueprint to having the impact and life you desire, even if you're not sure how to make it happen right now. I'll also tell you about the single biggest mistake new health and wellness coaches make and what to do instead. And I'll be teaching you exactly how to design a signature program step-by-step, including how to price your offer. And yes, I give you real numbers. To attend this class, all you have to do is sign up at drkimfoster.com forward slash six figures and reserve your seat for free. I will see you there.